Uh, hi, everyone, and welcome to another talk by the Lahore Literary Festival. Um, this evening, I've got uh, Adrian Hayes uh, with us uh, online, live on Facebook. Adrian is a record-breaking adventurer, a documentary presenter. He's an author. He's a mountain climber. He's a keynote speaker. He's a consultant. Um, he's lots of things. Hi, Adrian. How are you? Good evening, everybody. Good evening. I am now. Nice to have you with us today. And um, before we start, Adrian, just wanted to know what have you been doing this past year and a half during the COVID lockdown? It's a very good question, but mostly my adventure I've got from rock climbing and sailing, but uh, doing wow. my other hats as well, doing a lot of other work as well. So where have you been rock climbing? Mostly. Just locally in the UK. So I've been in the UK most of the last year and a half, uh, two months in Dubai uh, last uh, winter. Winter just gone, but mostly in the UK. So for everyone who's watching, Adrian has been to Pakistan several times and he's climbed K2 twice and he's written a fabulous book about that as well. He was with us at the Lahore Literary Festival two years ago, and um, which was absolutely wonderful. So I'm going to hand it over to Adrian. He's going to present today about his experiences, um, you know, and, you know, all the hats that he wears, and especially as a mountain climber here in Pakistan. And then we'll meet again, Adrian, for our Q&A session. Okay. Thanks. Uh, so thanks, over Anna. to you. Thanks, uh, Anna. Good evening, everybody. I'm going to start with a short video just to put you in the mood. Yeah. It's good because I've got it on film. <laughs> Arctic explorer bites the dust within 30 seconds of attempting to stay away to heaven. Anybody who sponsored him, I get your money back now. Never take yourself too seriously. So, good evening, everybody. Salam alaikum. Bismillah. Rahman Rahim. Salam alaikum. Pakistan Zindabad. And other greetings I can give you. Um, delighted to be back speaking at the Lahore Literary Festival. I had a marvelous time in Lahore um, a year and a half ago, January 2020, but lovely to speak to you online. So my name is Adrian Hayes and I am from the UK, although I've lived most of my life uh, overseas. And uh, I come under many hats. I mean, I'll tell you a minute, but tonight I'm gonna talk to you about my journeys up K2 and the, and the book uh, I wrote, which was this book, One Man's Climb, which was released uh, a year and a half ago in 2019. Now, before I speak, I'm gonna give you four, um, what's the word, four, four warm-ups, four provisos about what I'm speaking as. Uh, firstly, Amna, can you hear me okay? Just make sure my connection is still good. Yeah, I can't hear you, but I'm assuming... You're fine. You... You're fine. Good, great. I want to make sure because the connections can go. So four provisos. So firstly, I'm not coming to speak to you tonight as pretending to be one of Britain's greatest mountaineers, let alone the world. There are thousands and thousands and thousands of mountaineers who are better than I will ever be, okay? I'm an all-round adventurer. Mountains, polar, desert, jungle, Ironman, adventure racing, rugby, soccer, everything. So I'm an all-rounder. And in English, we say a jack of all trades, but a master of none. If you want to excel in any one sport, whether it's mountaineering or soccer or basketball, you have to do that. I haven't, I've done everything, okay. Secondly, uh, adventure is only one part of, of my life. I have many different hats as, as an author, as a speaker, as a consultant and coach on leadership and team and company development, as a campaigner and, and various different, as a documentary presenter, many different hats, even a sociologist these days. So there's many different parts uh, to, my, to my life. Um, 
Thirdly, I didn't climb K2 with the idea, right, I'll climb this, this book and I'll climb this mountain. And if I, if I get up there, I'll write a book on it. You know, I didn't plan this. I was asked to write this book for reasons I'll explain shortly. And fourthly, it's not a book just about K2 or mountaineering. It's a book about um, uh, many different aspects of our life um, today. So that's, uh, that's a quick introduction. So what I'm gonna do now is go back and share my screen and get you some little things. Let's just go on to here. So for that thing. So this was me this morning. It was quite cold this morning in the new forest in the Southern UK. Um, but I said some of the things I do, I, I, I said about sustainability, which is one of the most overused words in the world today. Basically, that is what it is. Economy, society, environment, they are all linked. So I speak on that. I'm also an advisor to a, a Mars project. I knew every island in the Pacific Ocean and Indian Ocean and every big mountain. Unless you know this, you, you, people are very much often unaware. Um, you ask them what the highest mountain in the world is, and they will say Everest. And you say, what's the second highest? And some half people will say K2. You ask them the third highest, and they'll say Kilimanjaro in Africa. But the reality is all the top, the biggest mountains in the world about the 170th highest mountains are in the greater Himalaya, from Bhutan, India, Nepal, China, Pakistan, and also into the, the old Soviet Union empire. They're all there. And to go the next highest mountain outside of this range, which is in Argentina, you have to go down to about the 170th highest mountain in the world. Okay, so everything is in these countries. And uh, so many, hundreds of peaks above 6,000 meters, 120 or so above um, 7,000 meters, and of course, 14 above 8,000 meters, of which K2 is the second. Now, the other 13, either shared between Nepal, China, and Pakistan, a lot of them are on the border. Um, so four of your peaks, of the five in Pakistan share the border with Pakistan. One of them, Nangaparbit, is solely in Pakistan. Some are solely in Nepal. One, share, one is shared with India and one solely in China. So all amongst these four countries share the biggest mountains. Now, K2, the second highest, it's had a long and pretty drama-filled history ever since its first ascent in 1954 by the Italians. Um, many people say to me, they say to me, look, I, I've heard it's, hard, it's even harder than K2, than, than, than Everest. I've heard it's harder than Everest. Is that right? And I say, having climbed Everest myself in 2006, uh, I would say they are considerably leagues apart. They are very vastly different mountains. Um, and the numbers speak for itself. I mean, Everest has now been climbed by about 8,000 people, K2 by about 420 at the last count, something like that. And the reason it's so much harder is because it's far further north than Everest on the Pakistan Chinese border, as you well know, those of you listening from Pakistan. Um, it's a far steeper climb. So, sorry, it's far further north, and so it's much colder and much more unstable weather, number one. Secondly, it's a far steeper mountain. Its elevation from base camp to the summit is the greatest elevation of base camp to summit of any mountain in the world. So it's a long climb. It's long. Above all, it is steep. Many, many degrees, 70 degrees, many vertical rock bands, ice bands of 70, 80, 90 degrees. So it's a steep and it's a technical climb. You've got to be a very competent ice climber and rock climber 
capable of moving at fast speeds at high altitudes. Okay, so a steep technical climb. It has uh, horrendous weather. It has avalanche dangers, rockfall dangers, and put these all together makes it a monumental challenge. And the history shows most years nobody gets up, with the with the exception of recent years, even though some haven't. But also many years people have died trying to. So for the 420 or so who have got up the top, there's about 90 who have died. So about one in five people who reach the summit um, die trying to get down or try, die trying to attempt it. So it's a, a, a very a difficult climb to, to undertake. And it's very, very remote. You can't get a helicopter out very easy or get rescued. But before we, uh, you know, why do you, you know, why do you want to do this with such high risks of, well, relatively high risks of dying and not many risks of, of um, getting to the top? Well, you know, some people say you must be very courageous. I say, no, not at all. But courage is not the absence of fear, rather the willingness to face it. But I'll come to the reasons at the second half of the presentation. Now, before we get to K2, uh, I would like to give a little bit of promotion to your own country. Uh, I am Pakistan's greatest ambassador. I said this at the Lahore Literary Festival last, uh, uh, last year. And let's be honest, the Pakistan we read about in the news, and, and frankly, media news focuses on bad news. That's what they are. They, they, bad news brings, pe brings people to watch and it gets advertising. I, I have stopped watching the BBC <laughs> and Sky and ITV because it's just so, so bad. Um, and what we read from Pakistan normally is only ever bad news, isn't it? And you will appreciate what I'm saying. What I show, and when I do my presentations across the world, um, I show the beauty of Pakistan. This is Skardu, beautiful town in Baltistan. And I speak about the luck, the, the, the great people your country has, you know, a friendly, warm people, which I have a great relationship to all in Pakistan. And, you know, the mountains are beautiful. And there's, remember, there's many mountains across the world that are beautiful. What's so special is these are relatively untouched. There is not so many people there in the Karakoram now, which is a unfortunate to the tourism industry. But I am hoping that when all of us who love your country promote it enough, that people will start flocking back to, to uh, the Karakoram and the rest of, of Pakistan, including Lahore, of course, which, which I did think was a, a marvelous city when I've been a few times before, but uh, which I really enjoyed when I was there a year and a half ago. So, um, I started preparing for K2 in, back in 2012. Uh, I'd been thinking about it many years, and, uh, but preparing for it, got a teammate, and when and did all the research and planning and training and climbing mountains in Dubai and Oman, where I was, where I was living, you know, meticulous preparation for this, for this massive, massive feat. But even though I'd seen many pictures of it, when I first next video which was recorded by my teammate um unaware well no, i was aware but he recorded my reaction to when i first saw k2 which is only after a nine day trek in the caracom to the last day it's hidden before then we're at uh, concordia about 4,500 meters and this is the first view you get of k2 now i k2 has been visible for about the last five minutes but i haven't set my eyes on it I've saved this moment to be recorded. My teammate Al Hancock is uh, taking the film. So I'm going to glimpse to my left. I'll have the first look of this, uh, of this mountain. Okay, so let me have a look. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, wow. Oh, wow. Yeah, that is uh, that is pretty impressive, and uh, 
It looks incredibly steep from here. In fact, it looks incredibly steep. How are we going to climb that? <laughs> One step at a time. <laughs> how how can we get up that thing? Anyway, uh, mountains look much steeper at distance. When you get a bit close, they look less steep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, that was my my I was my breath was taken away. And if you can see me in the, the side of the screen, I turned to see it and I went up in the air and I went, oh my, oh wow. And you heard me say, how are we gonna climb it? It looks so, so steep. So that was the view we got. And what I've put on what I've superimposed on the, the pictures is the camps you have. And very basically, how you climb big Himalayan peaks. You can do it what's called alpine style, climbing with lightweight, uh, setting your ropes up and, and going and climbing as you go. But most, the vast majority, you set what's called fixed line. So you get to base camp after 10 days, 11 days, you set up base camp, and then you start, start setting up the camp. So you'll, you'll hike, you'll climb to camp one and spend a few days there taking sleeping bags and tents and supplies. And you might have a what we say a rotation to camp two. You might have a check on what camp two, just there and then back and then down. And then another rotation, camp one, and then camp two for a few days, and then maybe up to camp three and then come down again. So usually two rotations uh, to take up supplies and stores and food and equipment. But above all, above all, what you are doing is you're trying to mitigate against the greatest challenge. Uh, you have on these big mountains, which is lack of oxygen. So what you're doing by, the, by this is acclimatizing. Now, if you think that the, the highest human habitation in the world is about 5,100 meters, which is the height of K2 base camp, humans have tried to settle higher. Actually, it's in, in, the, in the Andes in South America. It's a mining village. So they've tried to settle high, but they can't because at altitude, you, you lose your appetite. So at 6,000 meters, you can last a few weeks, no problems, but you eventually lose appetite. At 7,000 meters, after a few days, your body starts to deteriorate and you can't survive there. At 8,000 meters, you only have about 24 hours, 36 hours before you really will become quite ill. And at the top of these mountains, um, very little time. So. This is what you're doing, acclimatizing your red blood cells, increasing in number to allow you to temporarily get to the top after you've set up all these camps in good weather and then finally go for a, a summit push, camp one, camp two, camp three, camp four, to the top and back to camp four, and then hopefully down. Here's the camps. They are not like your weekend lovely camps in the countryside of Pakistan. They are built on the on debris and snow uh, of previous year's expeditions. There is, there is no flat space, so you have to build up these platforms. This is Camp 2 at 6,700 meters, which was one of the windiest places I've ever been on Earth. So it's quite uncomfortable. It's cold. It's windy. It's quite grim. So you see, you, if you spend any length of time there, you're going to deteriorate your, your bodily performance. As I said earlier, there's many vertical rock bands that you have to climb. And if any rock climbers are on in the audience, it's not with a bare top on and athletic overhanging rock climbs, but it's with a heavy pack on at 6,000, 7,000 meters uh, with crampons and a lot of equipment, quite tricky. And of course, you have um, you know, a lot of very uh, steepish ice bands to, um, uh, to, to, to climb as well with ice axe and crampons. So you know, quite a, a, a monumental challenge. Now, on my first year, um, 2013, actually nothing was really going right, uh, right from the start. There were climbers being killed on other mountains, and uh, things weren't looking right. The weather was not good, um, but we only had a small rotation up the mountain. We looked for a weather window and it wasn't very good. Basically, the small number of climbers, 20 odd climbers um, went up with Pakistan, Pakistani Hap, Payal supporters, and some Sherpas as well. And we got to camp two and 
basically the weather was so bad, the conditions above all was, was so bad that pretty much a joint decision was told to come down. Unfortunately, two guys decided to go up and that night they were killed, um, tragically. Yet another death toll on the mountain. So that ended that year's expedition. And I was quite distraught. Um, you know, two guys we got to know very well. The expedition had, had failed. I mean, but we, we had survived. But, you know, a quote I like is, the mountains will always be there. The trick is to make sure you are too. No mountain is worth losing your life on. And whilst I wanted to go back in a week's time, um, a, I couldn't find enough people to, to do it. So we abandoned it. Um, so that was the last site I had of K2 in, in 2013. And what I did then was, you know, really, you know, I decided quite quickly with Al Hancock, my Canadian teammate, to, to go back and, and climb it again the following year. But the second year, I think far better prepared, stronger team, stronger support, um, even physically more uh, attuned than previously. And the second year we had a lot better weather. We had great weather, long rotations, and it was all going very, very well. But everything when you do a big mountain comes really down to what they call the summit night. So you've You've been, you've been on a mountain seven weeks. You've, you've gone up to camp one and camp two and camp three. You've set up the camps. You're, you're acclimatized, you're fit, you're ready. And then you're waiting for the weather, good weather window to go to camp one, two, three, four, okay, in successive nights. That's generally how you do it. And then it all comes down to this. This is looking at the top of K2 from camp four really comes down to this five. This is that the, you've got in the Olympics, you've got the heats or you've got the, the county championships, the national championships, the European or Asian championships. You've got, then you go the world championships and you've got the heats for the Olympic final. You have the, the, the heats, the quarterfinals, the semifinals. This then becomes the 100 meter final, except it's not 100 meters, it's, it's a long distance. But this is the final race, the last, the last push. And basically, you're trying to get from this camp to the top of K2, so leaving at nighttime, 10 p.m. at night, a rough, to get to the top sometime in daylight the next day in order to get back down to this camp by, by darkness the next day. And I can tell you that climb and a photograph can never show how steep that is. That is a brutally steep and dangerous climb. That took us 15 hours to get up there, 15 hours, mostly because of the oxygen. And this is what it's like at, uh, at these vast, vast heights. Uh, I had a magnificent view, but frankly, you're so focused. You're so looking at your ice axe, your legs, your breathing, you, you don't get a chance much to, to enjoy the view until much, much later on. Bitterly cold through the night. Conversely, by the time we got to this, it was bitterly hot, brutally hot. I was sweating so much at this height. But after you know, three years really uh, on planning and preparation and training, failures and, 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 uh, and getting things together on the 26th of July, 2014. So um, seven years ago now, uh, I was lucky to stand on the top of K2. How long do you think I spent on the top? Some people say an hour, two hours, three. I, I spent about five minutes. A quick picture, a quick video, quick call back home on the satellite navigation, satellite phones, and then down. And, and a quick hug, because the weather closed in down and getting back down to that camp four was absolutely the, the, one of the hardest things I've done. It was so, so tiring. Your focus and you are drained from lack of sleep, lack of oxygen, you're tired, you're fatigued. So getting back down is, is so, so brutal. But I like to think, that challenges make you discover things about yourself you never really knew. You have immense potential if we all know what, uh, uh, how to go about it. So that was, I'm going to stop sharing for a second. So 
um, that was my um, journey up K2. And, you know, turning to, to the book now and, and what happened, and it was really, I was asked by a publisher who was related to the, the, the guys who died on K2. I had another book in play. I'd written this book before, my, my journey across the Arabian desert, not too far from you. Um, that was my first book. And I, I'd written, I, I had another book in mind on leadership development, my, my work in, in personal development. But uh, this lady asked me, could you please write a book on your K2 experience? And uh, it started, um, uh, and I started writing about it. And I think I really struggled to start with um, because I just, you know, I wasn't the first one to climb K2. Um, you, know, you know, about 300 or so others had done it beforehand. I wasn't the first Briton. Um, it was a powerful story, but there was, uh, but I thought, well, let, let's, let's change this, this way of this book. Let's, let's write about my personal story behind it, because I, I, I said at the beginning what, why, why I did this, and there was a very personal um, trauma involved at the time, which, frankly, you know, if, if you're in personal trauma, and I'm sure those of you listening have you know, you've lost relatives or close relatives to cancer, or you've lost your business, or you've become bankrupt or whatever. And when you become, um, you know, when there's trauma, there's depression, you can either sink to depression, you can take some nasty things, or in my case, you bury yourself in a, in a massive goal. So there was a reason I did this. But I bought a personal story, but above all, I also bought in lessons I like to think lessons for the world about society and humans and, and all the rest of it about what, 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 what is there in this book and what, you know, what is this, the, the things that I can share? So it became as much of a story about human development, society and the world around us as it became a, the story of climbing K2. So let me go back to sharing the screen. So, um, All right, that's not working. Let's just see this. There we go. So that was the that was the the, the book. So let me you know give you a, a few little things that I, I, I put in this book. You know, and I asked answer the question. Let me go back to myself so you can see me properly. Uh, uh, um, I asked the question about why we do these big things, and you know, let me tell you in all honesty, we, you don't climb K two to raise money for the poor of Pakistan. Okay. You don't um, trek to a, a polar ice cap to raise awareness of climate change. And you don't row across the Pacific Ocean to show others, women, diabetics, cancer sufferers, that they too can achieve your, their dreams. You don't. They're all great causes. But if you want to do those things, either um, work in the charity itself or become a coach or become a scientist, you do this for yourself. And I've got other lines. I do my little bit for the world. I'm passionate about the world we live in. And I do, I'm a patron of several charities and I do my things for the world. That's for the world. I'm passionate about people. I do my programs for personal development, leadership development, people, teamwork. That's my bit for people. But I do this for myself, these big expeditions. And there's nothing wrong with that. But what I found in the last um, 10, 11 years is what was doing it for yourself for setting your internal goals, challenging yourself, self-esteem, self-worth, you know, living to the extremes, making everything out of life has become replaced by these things. It's become more about that selfie on the top of some mountain or some race or some tour. External significance this recognition, respect, and fame. And that is what, frankly, people are doing it more so these days. Basically, it, either consciously or subconsciously, we're all in this pandemic of, through social media of really showing the world, look where I am, look what I've done, look at me. Um, unfortunately, as I said, subconsciously, and that is why the numbers doing these things right now, this was Everest, let me share a screen again, just a second. Um, this was Mount Everest, uh, I think a couple of years ago, that, sorry, this was Mount Everest in 2006 when I climbed it, 
And this was the, the scene, I think two years ago, taken by uh, um, uh, Nims Pardal, a, a, a Sherpa, an ex-Gurk officer. So many people doing it, even now on K2. In fact, lockdown has prevented so many people uh, uh, doing it. But, but even now there's people on K2, it's becoming the new Everest, which uh, is, I think it's a very dangerous thing. So, you know, but frankly, anyone thinking of climbing big mountains or big adventures and trying to make a name for themselves. I mean, your icons of the world, like Ashraf Aman, who I got, have met a couple of times, Nazir Sabir, uh, Ali Sab, uh, Sadpora, who sadly died on K2 in winter, and Sajid, his son, who's on there now. These are icons of the, of the sport, but anyone nowadays trying to get fame and recognition, respect, you're wasting your time because everything has been done. You have to do something so extreme. I, if anyone has seen the, the film Free Solo, starring this guy, Alex Honnold, who is an, a supreme rock climber who climbs without ropes, that's the extremes you've got to go to to get, if that's what you're after, recognition, respect. But I think it's, a, it's an unstable world um, that, that you're trying to do. So that was one thing I, I, I speak about there. I, I speak also about the, the importance of teamwork. It's a, for those of you in, in corporations, you know, we, we, we take teamwork so lightly. We don't really value. I mean, communication is the key, key thing, whether it's a relationship between husband and wife or whatever, or between a corporate team or an expedition, communication is everything on these, on, on, on these expeditions. And I, I value the teamwork side. And I, I often say I'm a member of a team and I rely on that team. I defer to it and sacrifice to it because the team, not the individual, is the ultimate champion. And uh, you know, I look at sports teams across the world, Pakistan cricket team included, and I, you, you can tell a, a great team will always outperform a team of supreme talented individuals. Teamwork is is of the essence. Um, I speak about the things when you have struggled for two months with very little creature comforts, we say, very little possessions, very little luxuries. You might have a good book, a base camp, but you're putting yourself into a distinct hardship. Um, you're in pain. You're in a lot of pain at these altitudes. You are freezing cold. You are boiling hot, you are tired, you are devoid of oxygen, you are devoid of all pleasures in life. But then looking over this view, this was the sunrise over Pakistan and China at about 8,400 meters. And you realize what is really important to you. I mean, you could pay hundreds of thousands of pounds for that view. Richard Branson has just gone into space and got that, but it's not the same from an aircraft or a spaceship. But you realize what is important to you when you've put yourself, and also the very real risk of dying. Uh, you don't take it lightly. And, um, and so, and it's not material possessions, it's not the biggest house, the biggest car, it really is your family and your friends and everything like this. And the other thing I speak a, a lot about this is about things that I think are very applicable to today's world. Risk, resilience, and resourcefulness. Risk, resilience, and resourcefulness. I would say, you know, that, that as a society, we have really lost our relationship with risk. Um, and I'm talking, of course, to the threat of a certain virus, which I am not a denier. It is a very serious virus. But we have acted the world as though it was the greatest disaster since the bubonic plague. Um, uh, it isn't. But, and, and this is where I will, I will defer, because I think in Pakistan, you are very used to risk and resilience. A lot of people in your country have it hard. Poverty, deprivation, water, power cuts. You know, it's not easy living in, in the developing world. But in the West, we've had it so good that we have completely lost all our relationship with risk, with mortality, mortality and resilience. 
to climb these mountains, you've got to have resilience. You've got to keep going. And one of the traits of resilient people is they expect bad things to happen. And I think we've, we've just lost this in the West. And this is why there's this panic and hysteria uh, over um, this thing, rather than looking at this rationally and uh, with a rational mind and a clear objective. And one of my things I say about all these things, risk, resilience, and resourcefulness, is being very clear about the objective you're trying to achieve. What is a clear objective? And so I speak a lot about these things as well. So all in all, um, there is, as I said, a lot of things that, that I hope really relates to, and I'll stop uh, sharing a second. It's as, as I said, it's much a book about human development society and the world we live in, as it is the, the story of climbing K2. And, and I've been so thrilled by people who've read it. Some people said they found it amazing for the team side. They found it amazing for the resilience. Some people found it very spiritual um, and a lot of things. And so that's why I'm, I'm, I'm quite proud of it. And of course, once you have written a book, I can speak for many authors. It's not about making money. I, I earn very little from nothing at all from this, but it's about you, you want people to read your story. There's a, there's a huge lesson, I think, for, for everyone um, in it, whatever your, your circumstances. Um, and we all have our own Everests and K2s in our life. We all have our challenges. The world's a challenging place these days. And I think, you know, one of the ways I, I'm speaking a lot about now is dealing with life's challenges in a positive rather than negative mindset. Uh, and, and that will enable us all to uh, more equipped to climb, not just K2, but any challenge we have in life. So what I'm gonna do before we have questions is share a video with you, about three and a half minutes. And then think of, I'm never short of questions. Think of any questions you would like. We'll put them on the chat line. Um, Amno is going to uh, moderate the questions as well. If I see any I like, I'll, I'll answer them. But first of all, enjoy this short video of my story, my tragedy and my triumph up K2. There is no camp at 7,000. There is no camp four. Reporting live from K2 Base Camp on the soap opera of the year. The bold and the beautiful was never as dramatic as this. <laughs> Just going down the seven route. And has come straight across.
Thank you very much, everybody, for listening and watching. And I am very happy now to take questions. Yeah, any questions yet? So photograph a final medley amna to finish uh, it off. Right. I don't know how many's on, but who has the first question? Amna, can you hear me? There we go. I think people are just coming on. So let me just widen the screen. So I... All right. I can't hear anything if you're trying to speak. Okay. All right. Hi, right, Adrian. Are you uh, done with your talk? Yes, yes, I am. Yes, I'm here. I'm here. Waiting for any questions that's coming in. I've got a final uh, montage at the end of three minutes before we wrap up. So if there's any questions okay. now, I can take it. Okay, just checking. Okay, so we don't have any questions right now from the audience. All right. But I do have a question for you. Yes, okay, carry on. <laughs> when are you planning to come again to Pakistan? Oh, that's a very good question. To... Yeah, that's a good question. Um, look, I'd love to come back to Pakistan. Firstly, to speak at the, the literary festivals, hopefully. Um, yes. And yes, in due course to climb, I'd love to visit my old friends in the Karakoram and uh, come back and see what you try on the other mountains. I'm, I'm not sure, possibly Nanga Parbat would be, it's a very big challenge, it's a very challenging mountain. So um, I think of the, of the 14, 8,000 meter peaks in the world, you, Pakistan has two of them, K2 and Nanga Parbat are the most difficult of, of all the 14. So, uh, so yes, I hope to come back. So possibly next year, inshallah. That sounds wonderful. And then what are your plans right now for the next few months in the, in the good weather, you know, in the fall? Yeah. So I've just, um, you know, just been redoing my website. So I'm doing a lot of uh, consulting and coaching, mentoring work. Um, mm -hmm. uh, speaking a few more documentary pre presentations in the pipeline. Um, and uh, yeah, a f quite a few little uh, projects on the go. As I said, I think you can get as much ad adventure just from rock climbing on a sea cliff as you can climbing going for two months uh, in a big mountain. Mm -hmm. There's, uh, you know, there's 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 a little bit of adventure in everyone, even a walk around a nice forest or something like that. So it's uh, it, it absolutely. It, it, I think I think people who've stayed in touch with nature and challenge themselves in a natural environment during this. COVID-19 pandemic have really benefited from that. Um, any tips or any advice to people who, you know, who sort of take on the elements or push themselves um, yeah, in, in this kind of 
extracurricular I, activity? I, I do. And I, I, again, going back to, to smartphones and things, you know, we, we've become so obsessed when we go to a nature spot, we've become so obsessed with taking a selfie again or taking a picture. I'm now leaving the phone at home. I'm just going out into nature and enjoying the walk. And it's amazing what you can see when you're not glued to your screen. And you, the observation of things that you miss or the communication, chatting with, with friends and what you can chat about when you don't have your phone. So, you know, I think, the, you know, yes. tips for everyone in lockdowns, lockdowns are not, you know, easy. And I'm not sure uh, Pakistan's latest situation, but. I get I get all my lessons from nature when I go in the forest or up a rock climbing or on the water. You get um, I, I get all my lessons. I think that's uh, so. It's it's what I try to do. Yes, absolutely. I agree with you. Um, I think it's really important, especially when you're out in nature, to cut off from from your electronic devices. And maybe if yeah. you're a photographer at heart and you really want to take pictures, take a camera with you. That, that actually is a very good tip. If you're re if you're really keen about the pictures, take a camera. Look, I've got nothing. I know people want to record their memories, but what I generally say is, if you have a little okay. day pack and you water and food, put the phone there. When you get to a lovely spot, you know, take the pictures and remember it, and then put the phone back on there. Because if it's in your pocket and you hear the buzz or hear the ring, you're you're always distracted. And I think just really, really get into what nature's got. I mean. To be honest, the, the best part of climbing K2, the most mm -hmm. enjoyable part was we went from Skardu to a, the drive to Escole and then the trek, the mm -hmm. eight-day trek. And that is the best part. The weather's good, the scenery. I sometimes put some music in my ears, some, you know, so just to make this the thing or just listen to nature. And that, that's the most enjoyable part. And anyone can really do that. Absolutely. I think one thing that I've done, and I must admit, is that I've watched a lot of YouTube videos of people doing sort of extreme exercise or, you know, taking on extreme challenges, like even walking to Everest Base Camp or K2 Base Camp. I haven't been able to do something like that myself, but I really, really enjoy seeing other people do it. I mean, it's wonderful that they've recorded it and we can see them do it. I think that's a great service one can do is like record your journey to a certain extent and to share with other people but you know cut off from connecting you know yeah, maybe just record I, I think the sharing and this is the one of the things i i said provided it's authentic authenticity is the right. key thing for me and i said about you know why we do these big mountains we don't do it to show others we don't do it for an orphanage in kenya we don't do it you know you, you do it, but as long as you're authentic, if you're sharing a video or film of the Karakorn to show people what the beauty of the country is, fine, yes. that's, that, that's great. If you're showing it to show, look at me, look what I've done, look how clever and how fit I am, let me take my shirt off to show my chiseled body, uh, you know, it's you're, you're doing it to show off, basically. So yeah, I, I, just, I absolutely agree with you. I think that's just so passe now. It's something which is, I mean, it's been done. It's short lived. It's something that should not sustain. And um, I think this this pandemic has taught us that you know what are the things that matter and what are the things that don't. And for someone like you who's really braved the elements, um, so that you know that advice coming from you is 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 very precious and important because you're speaking from a place of experience and yeah. um anything else that you'd like to close with um yeah um, advice you know i i think uh, again it, it come i think it comes back to what what do people need you know right now it, it's 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 a tough world out there and i think it's gone a bit chaotic um uh, i think you know I think get, I, I've touched on it already and you've touched on it very aptly. I think get back to the basic things of, of life, what we need. The, the, the social media world is just is a false world. And I'm frankly hoping that it just fades away. It becomes a, a mm -hmm. thing. It's useful for keeping contact with families. I use WhatsApp and Skype and for speaking to people and, and connecting. Mm -hmm. that, that's great. But the side of things of having to post everything up you know, we're, we're in this 
epidemic of, of wanting to show we're worthy. And I just don't think it really matters. I think getting, you know, life is tough, but life is, is fantastic as well. And the best things in life are not what you can buy or not being on social media or life. It's sitting around a fire, a campfire, whatever with lovely people and talking. And, 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 and that's what I learned. That's why my time in Lahore last year was just amazing. The rich conversations I had, and this is what makes special evenings. So, you know, uh, tough life, but there's, you know, look positive on it, everybody, and not so, not always the negative, what you read on the news. So I mean, Anna, what, what I'd like to do is, as a, before you finish, is to, I've got a photo montage with some, uh, some music I'd like to finish off with, if that's suitable. If um, Sure, please go ahead. Please go ahead. And, so and then, so um, um, you'll just have to do your share screen again. I will do that again. And just let me put this. So I've got, a, this is some pictures from the, from the book, uh, everybody. And uh, which really sums up how I felt about the, uh, sums up the sort of the whole two years of K2 and a very personal journey for me too, which you'll see at the end. So, so before just, you click on that, Adrian, I'd just like to thank you. Yeah. Thank you yeah, for sure. your lovely talk, and we'll finish off with your with your presentation. Yeah. Thank you. And everyone, anyone wants to connect with me on, on my social media, having scorned it, I don't use it that much. I go on every few weeks only, but that is my social media handle, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram and website. So delighted to connect with you. Please, if you want to send personal messages, please do. I will always answer personal messages as well, uh, anyone who wants to connect with me. So uh, I'm gonna share with you, as I say, to finish off some pictures set to music of my story of, of One Man's Climb. Of course, One Man's Climb with a lot of other people involved. It was a great team, a lot of support, and of course, you know, for the porters of Baltistan, above all, the, the people fantastic in, in your country, just a, a big thank you and a Pakistan Zindabad. Enjoy the show. Oh, yeah. 
Thank you very much, everybody, and hope to come back to Pakistan someday in the future. That's made me all cry. <laughs> Thank you, Sam. Thank you, Lahore Literary Festival, indeed.